<laughs> Welcome. It is the Book Fest, Spring 2021. And this is day two. We are dedicating it to writers. A lot of times if you're a reader, that gives you the inspiration to want to become a writer. And that's why this day is dedicated to you who are ready to pick up the pen and start writing or start wailing away at that typewriter. And to kick it off, we're talking with somebody who is probably one of the most prolific writers that I know. We have Jonathan Mayberry with us. He has, he is a New York Times bestselling author, five-time Bram Stoker Award winner, he is a board member of the Horror Writers Association, and I think that's how we first met through that organization. He's also the president of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers, and he has he's this genre-hopping type of a writer. He's written horror and thrillers, and he has written novels, anthologies, comics, TV shows. He's got so many different things under his belt, and that's really what it means to be prolific. Now, Jonathan joins us and you see, as you can see everybody, he's falling asleep right now because <laughs> he, he has been so busy lately. So Jonathan, thank you for taking the time to join us. How are you doing? Uh, my, my pleasure, Desiree, and, and uh, it's great great to see you again. And uh, I'm, I'm doing well, having fun. You know, yeah. I, I'm living the actual life. Yeah, and, and that's what we were just kind of chit-chatting about as we got started here because so many writers look up to you. They look at you and they say, I want to be Jonathan Mayberry when I grow up. So tell us, what's it really like being Jonathan Mayberry? Uh, it's it's weird. Um, it's fun weird, but it's weird. I, you know, I've had a lot of different careers over the years, but writing is is always what has, you know, kind of formed the core of, of what defines me. Um, but for most of my life, I was actually writing part time. I, I was a magazine feature writer and college textbook writer and so on. When I became a novelist in 2006, or when my first novel was published in 2006, I kind of believed in the mythology that a writer would write a novel, send it off, spend the rest of the year, you know, uh, talking with, 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 their, uh, with colleagues over beers at, at, at pubs and doing occasional signings. I had no idea how busy the writing world actually gets once you're deeply into it. And, and now um, it's become a really, really, really busy uh, business for me. It's, it's actual, it is actually my business. I'm a, uh, it's all, I've, I'm an S corp, you know, so I'm actually a business. Um, but I am in that group of what, what are called high output writers, like people like Kevin Anderson and the late, um, uh, Rachel Kane and, and others who we write best when we're in the fast lane. Um, in fact, the stuff I write when I have a lot of free time tends to reflect that. It tends to wander around in any direction except the point. Whereas when I write fast, it kind of brings back my old journalistic background. I was trained as a journalist where it's, you know, you write it quick and dirty, fix it and rewrite, move on to the next project and the next. And that's become the, the mojo. And, and I'm, you know, I'm digging it. But it, but it is this tiring. But, you know, I'm, I'm getting tired doing what I love. So, you know. Yeah. Know. Yeah. How many, how many words do you output per day? Do About you know? 4,000 a day. Wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. And and sometimes, you, sometimes it's a little less if I have other things to do, like if I'm doing pitches for TV or, or uh, you know, work on a comic book script. Um, and sometimes if I'm near the end of a book, it may jump up to, to eight to 10,000 uh, for the last few days of it. So the big question, are you plotting? Are you pantsing? Are you somewhere in between? And how does your journalistic background, because you kind of mentioned how that seems to kind of fuel your writing stamina. Well, I'm definitely a plotter. Um, I've found that, uh, if I know where it's going to go, if I have a structure, I have the mathematical formula of cause and effect of the entire plot. You know, this action plus this action equals that, you know, kind of in, uh, imperative ending. Um, it allows me not only to to write faster because I know where it's going and spend less time going on tangents that don't really serve the, the story. Um, it also allows me to write non-sequentially. So, for example, today I was working on, uh, I'm working on a, an epic fantasy novel, my 41st novel. And, um, you know, I, I was working on a subplot where I just focused on one subplot, knowing where it's going to go, and then cut and paste those el those elements into the, the main body of the story, rather than have to follow the whole book sequentially. And sometimes I'll just jump around and write whatever scene appeals to me. But because I know what the story is, I know where to fit it. That way I never get bored. Um, I always have something I can do in, in the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, 
works really well. But yeah, I'm definitely a plotter. As far as the journalism background, I went to Temple School of Journalism, and um, I had a couple of teachers that at the time, especially this one guy, I hated him at the time. I would have happily fed him to like rabid wombats if I could have, except everything he taught me, I have since been able to use to, to not only build my career better, but become a more efficient writer, like not mythologizing the process of writing, um, not waiting for the muse to hit me. You know, you, you just get out there and write it. Always have a word count. Um, always have a point of view when you write. Don't just, you know, collect facts. Say, you know, filter them through uh, some point of view. A lot of different things. And uh, also to write every day. Those work habits have become invaluable. And I wish that professor was still alive because I'd like to take him out to dinner and get him really hammered. And thank you. <laughs> Well, I think that you can give props to all educators and teachers and instructors out there because a lot of times I, I hear that a lot from them where somebody will come back years later and say, no, it makes sense. So it's great words of advice. Yeah. In fact, my English teacher from 11th grade, who is, uh, I think, the best teacher I ever had, Frank Donahoe uh, from Frankfurt High School back in Philly, he was um, one of the first people to really give me strong encouragement about pursuing it as a career. and. Um, uh, he's he's in retirement now. He's about 300 years old. He's living in uh, Ocean City, New Jersey. And I, I'm glad that he lived long enough to be able to see my career and and to see that, you know, he was in fact correct that, you know, he said I, I was going to be a success. And it took me a long time to believe that. And, and it's nice to know that, that he saw that early, early on. And, uh, you know, teachers, good teachers are worth their weight in gold. They really are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in many ways, as you are doing it, you are a teacher or at least an inspiration for, for many people. And, you know, that's part of why we're doing this right now. So tell us, what's that core fundamental thing that is needed for somebody like you to write in so many different genres and in so many different mediums? Because, I mean, again, we've got graphic novels and comics and novels and like what, what do you feel is the core fundamental thing going on there? Well, this goes back to a conversation I had with Ray Bradbury when I was 13. Um, and part of that, that the message of that conversation from him was a writer writes. If you have the skills of writing, it almost doesn't matter what your bias is, what your preferred comfort zone is. You should be able to get into whatever um, topic it is, whatever genre, whatever point of view, and be able to write. Now, it may not be the thing that, that you know, any one thing may not, may not be that thing that most excites you or draws you or even speaks to your best skill set, but you should be able to do at least a workmanlike job in any field. And along the same lines, um, in that same conversation, the other person who was in that conversation was Richard Matheson. And he had defined his entire career by not having any two books that technically would fit on the same bookshelf somewhere in time and I am legend. I mean, to give you an idea of, of the, the the disparity between his, his genre, he said, never let yourself be pigeonholed. Write the book you are most passionate about and then try to sell it. Uh, Bradbury added to that, not only write the book you're passionate about, but write the book you would go out of your way to track down and read. Well, as a reader, I read all over the, all over the map anyway. I read mysteries and thrillers and horror and poetry and, you know, so why shouldn't my writing reflect that? And what I found as a result, my willingness to try new things is actually kind of the, the core of, of my success. You know, I thought I wanted to be a journalist. I went to school for, for newspaper writing. The one thing I have never done is write for newspapers because I started getting interested in magazine features in college. I started writing mass market textbooks when I was teaching in college, not teaching journalism. I taught women's self-defense, martial arts history, and, and uh, the history of jujitsu at, at Temple University. I would write my textbooks. Um, I, 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 I wrote greeting cards at one point because I saw something in writer's market that, that um, a Hallmark was la launching a new line called Shoebox. And they were looking for someone to write greeting cards. I jumped on that. You've I written did, Shoebox greeting cards? This I did not know. I did some of the early versions of the, um, what are they, the Edith cards, I think they're called now. The okay. old lady, thank you, little old lady. With the, I did 12 of those. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, long, long time. I still get royalties once in a while, a couple of bucks a year. Um, I've done plays. I've done I've done uh, poetry and and really bad pretentious song lyrics for a heavy metal band. It's awful, but I keep trying other things, and I tried fiction as a lark, 
And it turns out that's not only what I love doing most, and I didn't know that until the early 2000s, but it's what I've become most successful at. But I've also tried writing for for YF, for young adult, for middle grade. Uh, the opportunity to write comics came along. I had no idea how to do it. I said yes, and then figured it out. So, you know, it's always following that same thing as if there's an open door and the possibility to, you know, make a sale, ex uh, expand your writing capabilities and have some fun. And I'm, I'm definitely going through that door. Saying yes and then figuring it out. I think that's great advice. And a lot of times writers have, they feel like it's that imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. They, they feel like they shouldn't be there. They're not a writer. When do they get to call themselves a writer? What do you have to say for people that might be feeling a little bit too humble? You know, it's funny about that. First off, try it anyway. You know, you never know until you try it. Uh, second, imposter syndrome never goes away. I've been on imposter syndromes with people like Charlene Harris, who, who you know, wrote the books True Blood's based on. Kevin Anderson, who's had a hundred and something bestsellers. Rachel Kane, who was, you know, she would knock him out of the parks. Uh, Heather Graham, who's, you know, 200 million books in print. We've been on panels on imposter syndrome because we still get it today. You know, I'll hear I'll, I'll hear from my buddy uh, James Rollins, who's number one New York Times bestseller if he publishes his laundry list. Still halfway through every novel, you know, he'll send an email to his friends like, I, uh, uh, this is the one that's going to sink me. You know, I, I, this is this is not going to work for me. Every book. So it doesn't go away. What differentiates us from people, uh, from other writers is, we don't let imposter syndrome stop us. We acknowledge that it's a thing and we keep punching anyway. Um, and that's really the big difference there is you just can't let yourself be talked out of it by that inner parasite that, you know, is so much a fan of books that they don't, it doesn't allow you to think that you could write books that you would be a fan of, but you're it, not, you're, you're not doing it. You're writing for books to satisfy your creativity and other people, you know, hopefully will become fans of them. Yeah. And you mentioned James Rollins uh, and actually his talk is coming up a little later on. We're talking about the science of storytelling with him. So I'll throw that one at you. What do you think makes for a great story? Great story is something, and it's funny, stories are, are very personal. Um, great stories are something that you would find uh, compelling to read. And I go back to the Bradbury advice. I always write the story that I would find most interesting to read. So anytime I'm, e even if I'm asked to write a story for a specific anthology, I have to noodle around to find a story that if, if I knew this story was in there, I would go and, and read it. So it has to please you at the same time. It also has to respect the audience. Um, and a good example of that is uh, I was asked some years ago by editor, John Joseph Adams, to write a story for an Oz anthology. Now, my gut reaction as a horror writer, because I broke in as a horror writer, was to write a story where the Tin Man gets the heart of a serial killer and goes on a rampage with his ex. And there's a good portion of my fan base that would enjoy that story, and I would probably enjoy writing it, but it isn't the audience for the Oz books. And I couldn't let myself be self-indulgent. So yes, I would enjoy writing it, but at the same time, I wouldn't enjoy thinking about kids reading it. So I have to also think about who the audience is. So the story I wound up writing, The Cobbler of Oz, um, is a cute little story about a little winged monkey girl. In the, in the books, the, the winged monkeys are a sentient race, and they were slaves later on of the witch. But before that, they were just a you know cool race living in, in Oz. And she, But her wings were too small, so she couldn't fly. So she wanted to get magic traveling shoes to take her all the places her wings couldn't take her. And even as I'm writing it, I'm thinking, what the heck? Where did this come from? You know? And um, the result was not only did the story, you know, suit the, the the kids who would be reading Oz stories, it got pulled out in a lot of reviews because of that, because some of the writers, some of my friends, in fact, wrote stories that played more to them and their existing fan base rather than the fan base of the Oz books. Um, and then I heard from the estate of L. Frank Baum, and they included that story in the official chronology of Oz, um, which was one of my biggest career moments. And uh, I must admit that was that was a tearful moment. Um, but it wouldn't have happened had I written self-indulgently rather than also considering who the who the readers of that book are. Uh, that's excellent advice is thinking about the reader. I mean, that's your audience. That's number one. 
but to be totally self-indulgent and write the Tin Man gets the heart of a serial killer book, that would be awesome. Maybe I'm, put that on the back burner and come back oh, to that it's later. It's going written as a short story at some point, no doubt about it, because I get asked about it all the time. Because a lot of people know that that was my first inclination, and I get I get harassed by people all the time about writing that. So let, let, let's talk about some, some of your actual projects. Rotten Ruin was basically how I became introduced to you, Jonathan Mayberry. I'm, I'm a zombie fan. That's my core. Zombies versus vampires. Zombies win every time. Any chance of that being picked back up again? Is that series just kind of done now? How do you feel? I mean, you should ask. Well, first off, uh, you know, there are seven books in the series. You know, so a lot of people don't realize that Broken Lands and Lost Roads were actually the end of the Rotten Ruin series that I started. There was a marketing thing, and they did they decided to market it as something new rather than a continuation, which was a mistake. Anyway, um, Alcon Entertainment is developing it for film right now. They they are on second draft of a script with one of the Marvel script writers. Wish I could tell you who right now, but it, you know, non-disclosure agreement. Um, Webtoon had adapted it and was the number one horror, horror comic on Webtoon. But um, we are in discussions right now about me starting up the Rotten Ruin series again as a series of new graphic novels, not adaptations, brand new graphic novels. Maybe one set with, you know, that takes place right after the ending. I don't know if you read the ending of Lost Roads or not, but the epilogue of Lost Roads sets up a potential new direction for the series. I would want to follow that with some graphic novels. But I also, I would want to do one where I went back and told the story of Tom Amore as a younger man after, like when Benny's still a little kid, when he's just trying to sort out how to survive in the zombie apocalypse. He was the most popular character in the entire series. So I'm probably going to do that as well. But So I'm not done with Rotten Ruin, not, not by a long shot. Oh, that's exciting. I love hearing that. So speaking about getting something adapted, V Wars was adapted. It was a Netflix series. What did it feel like? When you saw your characters, your words, I don't know how much they adapted the you know the dialogue practically, but what does that feel like when something that was once in your head was turned into words suddenly is on the screen? Uh, surreal. You know, I've never done drugs, but I'm pretty sure that's what an acid trip would feel like um, because it doesn't feel like it's happening for real. I, I you know. The first time I heard the actors read some of the words, and some of the dialogue is out of the books. Um, the first time I heard them is uh, I was invited up to Toronto for the table read. The first time the actors were all meeting to do the first table read. And I walked in there, and first off, you know, I expected to be, you know, somewhat marginalized because I had heard how much in Hollywood for years the writer was not really all that welcome in, in these things. They just wanted him to sit there and shut up. That has changed quite a bit. IP is now king. Intellectual property is now king. And I, I didn't know that at the time. And I walked in, and all these actors who I've seen in all these different uh, you know, shows, horror, science fiction, so I got a standing ovation from them. And I'm, I literally looked behind me to see who they were applauding. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that, that was really weird. And Ian Summerholder, who was the star of the show, pointed out to me, uh, he says, you know, everyone in this room and the 100 people involved in the production of the show have jobs because of that book. And that hadn't occurred to me either, you know. Um, but when they, when I'm sitting there and they read the first, I think it was three episode scripts, I was kidding the candy shop. I, somebody told me I didn't stop grinning the entire time. You know, I just sat there, you know, like probably the oldest person in the room and I'm grinning like a kid the entire time. It was fantastic. And then, then Netflix took us all out to dinner after the table read. And I'm sitting there with, you know, Laura Vandervoort from Smallville and and and, uh, uh, and Bitten and, and Ian Summerholder from Vampire Diaries and Lost and all these, these folks. And I'm sitting there with them and I'm like, this is nuts. This is absolutely nuts. Um, it was the best time seeing it on TV. My son and I were splitting a bottle of Netflix and sent me a bottle of Dom Perignon. So we split a bottle of Dom as we were watching the show. It, it was, it was nuts. It was so surreal. Um, and I, it, I'll never forget how much fun I had with that. Unfortunately, the show debuted right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. That did not, that was not fertile ground for a show about a pandemic to, to launch. So, uh, it didn't last more than a season, but we are hopefully going to get, well, we're definitely going to get the rights back and, uh, shop it again once the COVID thing is kind of in the rearview mirror. 
Yeah, yeah. COVID just sent a tailspin into so many things. There's so many writers who write, I mean, I have actually a copy of your pan Pandemica here, but anything pandemic related, apocalypse type related, you think it would do well, but people were, were living it. So they didn't want to really be experiencing it in their entertainment. Well, I could, I mean, there, there was a movie called Quarant, I think it was called Quarantine. Um, Kate Winslet and, and, uh, hmm. Lawrence Fishburne, I think it was quarantine. That did well because it was about a, a disease very similar to COVID, but there was an ending to it. They found a cure at the end. So that became popular at the time because also the science and the, the way it unfolded was pretty accurate. Pandemica came out. I had written that over a year before COVID. And by the time it was illustrated and, and put in a comic book form, originally, originally a five issue comic series, um, the first three issues came out prior to COVID. The fourth came out early in COVID. It the fifth didn't come out for months and months because not only you know was it was it a pandemic comic book and it, no promise of a happy ending, but also the comic book distribution company um, Diamond was not an essential service and they weren't distributing comics. Uh, so they, it's weird. The graphic novel collection of all five issues came out before the fifth issue of the comic. Oh wow! It was weird. Yeah, yeah, very weird. Okay, I want to circle back to some of the other things that you've yeah. done or kind of revitalized or have your fingers into. Weird Tales Magazine. Can you talk about that? There it is. <laughs> um, so Weird Tales is almost 100 years old. Uh, it was launched in 1923. It's, it was that zone between horror, science fiction, and fantasy where the stories didn't quite fit in standard genres. And it launched the careers of H.P. Lovecraft, Robert e. Howard, C.L. Moore, Super Quinn, all these. I mean, Richard Matheson wrote wrote for uh, uh, Tennessee Williams wrote for it. You know, everyone wrote for Weird Tales. Um, it has some troubled history. I mean, some of the original stories tended to reflect the homophobia, racism and sexism of um, of, of that era. You know, the, the, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and then we had the Anne Vandermeer era, which was fantastic. And they asked me to originally come along and just contribute the story to the rebirth of it. But then they realized they really needed an editor. So they asked me to be the editor. And as my second issue just came out, uh, I made sure that the stories reflected diversity. So, you know, we've had very strong uh, racial diversity. We've had LGBTQT writers of various kinds. Uh, we've had uh, international writers. It's reflecting the how powerful weird storytelling is around the world and filtered through different experiences. You know, a black man from the South is going to write a different idea of what is scary than a, say, an entitled white guy from from uh, the Northeast of, of the country. And we want- They that. think each other is scary, unfortunately. That's the problem. They really do. <laughs> times. And, you know, we want the stories to reflect what, what scares you, what's weird to you individually. And that's given us some real, really uh, uh, good stories. And what fact, one of the stories uh, up from slavery, which was the first one I, I asked for from Victor Laval. Um, and uh, actually he was the first person I contacted uh, in for this issue, which was my first issue. That story is now in development for film. Um, and it's a very, very, very tough story about racism and monsters. Oh, I love it. I love it. And not to go, go too far, but it's such a great topic because we do see so many, many um, stories and things coming out that are in that realm. Lovecraft Country, for example, the new TV show Them, I'm only a few episodes into it. But we do see those black horror stories coming to life in ways that we haven't haven't seen even just a few years ago. Sure. I mean, and Watchmen too. And pr probably Watchmen mm -hmm. is the best example for me personally. Um, I grew up in a household where racism was pretty common in a neighborhood where racism was extremely common. And I, you know, I learned about diversity through the character of the Black Panther, but also through allegorical shows like some episodes of Star Trek where there was a show about an episode about racism, but they didn't call it racism. It two similar alien races that looked different to them, but same to us, you know. But think about what, you know, in terms of horror. You know, we love, we revere a story like Dracula, where Dracula kills, what, about seven people in the entire length of the book? Imagine growing up in the Deep South, you know, prior to and then during the Jim Crow laws, when, you know, just looking at a white woman can get you lynched. Just being black out in the street can get you, I mean, just, we have now, stopped by cops, frisk shot, whatever. There's a different 
uh, amount of weight that goes into what is scary when you're living in an environment where you are considered a monster, but everyone around you actually is, is a monster treating you, you know, uh, like something they need to destroy. That fuels a lot of important storytelling. And now we are, we are finally at the point in 2021, way past when it should have happened, where we're getting some of these stories, not only told, but told in big formats. Jordan, you know, uh, Jordan Peele. I mean, some of the, the, the stuff he's doing is so powerful. Um, Watchmen is an example because I mean it starts off with that with that brutal uh, event, um, which a lot of white people never knew existed. You know, the the, the the attack in that town. Those are terror stories. They're horror stories, and now we're telling them appropriately as horror stories, not with a white person coming into the story to be the point of view of the, of, of the viewer and then solving the problems for everyone, as in movies like The Help. No, no, no. This, this is filtered from the part, point of view, the, the perspective and experience of the black characters. And, and that is really rich to see. And the same is going for, for LGBTQ uh, stories, where we're seeing these things uh, told from those writers as opposed to from uh, a, like say a straight white guy trying to tell the story and, you know, hoping he doesn't fall into cliche. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you raise a provocative topic too. I mean, as a white writer, a white male writer, it is incredible when you can crawl literally into somebody else's skin and have all these different points of view. We should do that because then it's, you know, but then at the same time, do you feel like an American dirt type situation where you might get, you know, criticized for not letting people tell their own stories? Well, nothing, I'm not preventing anyone from telling their own stories with what I do. I, I celebrate the stories that, that every good writer tells. And because I, I focus a lot of my career and a lot of my public speaking on elements of diversity, I'm, you know, I'm out there being a cheerleader for more voices, for more, more uh, writers to tell their own stories. That said, there's nothing preventing any writer from being able to tell a story involving any kind of characters, as long as that writer does legitimate research. Now, some writers rely on on the sensitivity readers, and that's okay. <laughs> I, I go a somewhat different route, like with my novel Ink, my most recent um, uh, print novel. Um, there, there are two elements of that that book that do not speak to my personal experience. One is, you know, I'm not tattooed, and the story deals with tattoo culture. So instead of just making assumptions, I interviewed close to 300 people who have tattoos and tattoo artists and people who have had tattoo removed, tattoos removed because I wanted to understand why they did what they did, what the meanings are of the tattoos, has it changed, how people react, and so on. There's also a romance in there between a lesbian and a bi-curious woman. Now, clearly, I'm not either of those things. So I interviewed women who were one or the other, or someone who had been like one character, one friend of mine had been, a, you know, married. She thought straight married, and then head toward bisexual, and then realized after a time that really what she was was a lesbian trying to conform to what her family expected of her. And um, so I, I interviewed these women to get those stories, and also to 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 let them vet the chapters I wrote afterwards, so that I didn't fall into the habit of standard male cliche. I don't want to assume that I understand the point of view because it's not my point of view. But good deep research, listening, helps. And that's that's there's a difference between writing a character that you hope is is a is a fair representation. And talking to people who are that, who embody that, and listening to their experience and trying to capture it. If you do that, you're not doing something uh, like American Dirt where you're just hijacking or borrowing. It's not cultural appropriation if you've done the research and done it fairly and deeply with great respect without filtering it through your needs as a storyteller other than your desire to tell the truth. Right on. I could not agree more. And since you brought up Ink, a novel, I'm so glad you did. Why do you say that this is your best to date? Um, well, there's a lot of things about Ink that that really came together for me. First off, it has some of my favorite characters in it. In my first, the, you know, Mike Sweeney and, and Val Guthrie and Crow were introduced to my first three novels. I love those characters. Crow and Mike are both semi-autobiographical. There are elements of their stories from my first three novels that reflect some things in my own life. Um, 
so I, I have a gr great affection for them. The character of Monk Addison, who is the the, the main point of view character in the book, um, is I think the most interesting and complex individual I've created with a possible exception of Joe Ledger, but um, he's not the action hero type. He is a very damaged individual who has found a particular way to use his damage. Um, and uh, plus, you know, I think the research, the, the, the nature of the villain and what the villain's agenda is are all unique to my experience as a writer. Also, I think the allegory and metaphor in it, the, this figurative language really, uh, allowed me to tap into my great love of poetry. I read poetry aloud every morning before I write. Um, and I, I think that book has, has some of my best lyrical writing in it, at least, you know, just total per personal perspective. Uh, and also I enjoyed the hell out of it. I enjoy, I loved the research and I love the writing. I love the feedback that people are giving me because a lot of folks have even asked if I'm, if I'm gay, which I'm not. Um, but I, I, I listen, you know, and, um, People are surprised when I don't have tattoos because I, you know, I, I really felt that I got inside the heads of the characters in a way that accurately reflected their experience rather than my perception of what their experience might be. And plus, I think it's just creepy as shit. I mean, <laughs> the villain in that is, even I thought the villain is like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> and do you wonder sometimes you're like, where did that come from? Because that, that, that's your villain. I mean, you're yeah. you're kind of creeping yourself out there, right? Uh, you know, it, it's it's a weird thing because I I've come up with some creepy villains over the, over the years, and people ask me, you know, why do you write about monsters? And my answer is that I don't write about monsters. I write about people who fight monsters. The bigger the monster, the bigger the fight, the greater the distance that the character needs to rise to the challenge, which is a, a wonderful thing to see. A character expanding their their strength, their knowledge, their you know, fighting through their fear to find their courage. All of that is fantastic, but you don't get an opportunity if the stakes aren't big enough. So you want to create a villain worthy of that level of fight. Gotcha. Gotcha. Understood. Now, the fact that you read a little bit of poetry every morning before you write, I love that. Do you have any other things that you do or even advice or tips for writers to do to help kind of get their day off or get their creative energy going? Uh, yeah, first off, um, make it a, a set writing time. You know, like I, I'm self-employed. I can start writing anytime I want. But I'm at my desk at 8 o'clock every morning. Uh, I've got my coffee made. I usually set up my coffee pot the night before, click the button, take my shower, get dressed, sit down with a cup of coffee, and write. Um, I use the trick. I'm pretty sure Faulkner started it, but Dean Koontz is the one that you talked about it a lot of. Leaving the last sentence I was writing unfinished. So I go in, I finish the sentence, and it kind of puts me right into the gear again. Uh, I also really advocate that writers not spend a lot of time mythologizing the process of being a writer. Don't wait for the muse because that's, I hate to, to say it's a little silly, but it's, it's a little silly. You know, a writer puts your butt in the chair and you write. And if it isn't right, you fix it in the rewrite. Don't try to write perfect. Try to write as, as good as you can write in that moment. The perf we, we never hit perfection. But real beauty in fiction happens in the revision process for the most part. So get the get the thing done, and then go in there and be that that sculptor, be the be the um, the interior designer who goes into that house you just built and makes it beautiful to live in. You know, do that after in your revision. But get get the draft done. Um, don't rewrite during the draft. That's a really big thing because it slows you down to a crawl. And one thing I found is really, really, really helpful. And I wish I could remember which of my writer friends suggested this. Um, I haven't been able to figure that out yet. But a while ago, oh, I actually just remembered. It was Jack Ketchum, uh, Dallas, Dallas Mayer. Um, he, he said that years ago, I think we were at the Stoker Awards. He said one of the, the, the tricks to getting faster when you're with your writing is write the ending first. Write the ending and then aim at the ending. And that way you're less likely to veer off into tangent and you, so what you write uh, serves the story. I found that when I do that, uh, which I now do all the time, um, I'll do my outline, I'll write the first chapter, I'll jump to write the ending of the story. It's speeded me up by four times at least because it makes you less dubious about what it is to write next. You know where you're going, you know, so go write that. And um, 
those are, you know, the other thing is, you know, other than the advice Bradbury gave about, you know, only write what you would go out of your way to read. Uh, there's a relentlessness to it that's important. Uh, if you're, if you want to write, people that that love you and support you will try everything they can to talk you out of it by saying it's too hard, you won't make money, there's lots of rejections, blah 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 blah. We know this. Every issue of Writers Digest will tell us this. Every writers conference will tell how hard it is. Okay, we know it. Being a surgeon, being an airline pilot, being a tier one special operator or an, or a figure skater is hard too. Clearly, it, people can do it because we see people doing that. There's no proof for any writer who's just starting out that you won't be successful. So why go into it with the assumption you're going to fail? That's that's just believing in propaganda and allowing propaganda to do its negative work. You have no proof yet. So put it, put your whole heart into it and have some fun. I love that. Excellent. Have you ever been to that point, though, Jonathan, where you just said, I want to give up. I can't do this. At a time, maybe early in your career, we're just like, I can't do this. This is crazy. Actually, Have you been there? Yeah, quite a few times. The biggest moment for me was, I think it was 1999. I had been doing part-time magazine work, and I had had a few nonfiction um, uh, books out, but they're mostly college textbooks. And I had lost track, lost touch with, with the professional writers I knew. Um Bradbury Matheson were in California. They weren't coming to New York for, for the events anymore. Um, it just I'd lost touch with writers. And I, I got to the point where I wasn't making enough money at it. It felt like it was same old, same old, and I just got tired of it. And uh, my wife suggested I take a writing class. I'm like, I don't need to take a writing class. I've sold hundreds of articles. She said, Yeah, but you're always bitching that you don't know any other writers. Guess who's in a writing class? So I took a writing class under protest, you know, wound up the people who, uh, the woman who was teaching it was part of the Philadelphia Writers Conference board. And they were just about to do the Philadelphia Writers Conference. I had never been to a writers conference. Went under protest, spent all three days, mostly skipping the classes and spending time in the common room talking to other writers. By the time I left there, I was supercharged again. And oddly enough, it wasn't magazine features I was supercharged with. I wanted to do mass market nonfiction, which I went off and did four over the next couple of years. And then I got interested in fiction. Um, but it supercharged me by just by being around other writers. And that's, you know, something like the, 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 the book fest. One of the things about that is, yeah, it attracts readers. It also attracts writers. And you can go there and you can meet writers or hear them online uh, Writers can meet each other. We talk to the fans. Social media has allowed us to be to ex, expand our connections and become part of a bigger community, and that helps a lot with the blues or the, you know, I don't think I can go f any further sort of feelings, because every writer you talk to has hit some point like that, and has a story on how they got around it, and there are a thousand different ways to get around those moments. Talk to enough writers, you'll realize that every solution or every problem has a solution and often multiple solutions. Yeah, yeah. And you segued, you just went right into the next question I was going to ask, which was about collaborating with writers, working with other writers, writers groups, writers conferences. So just to be a little bit more specific, how about working with, collaborating on projects with other writers? Funny you should ask. I just signed a contract yesterday to do collaboration, to collaborate on three novels. We haven't made the big announcement yet, so I can't give details. But um, I've done a, a my first collaboration was I think a nonfiction book I was doing where um, I had to deliver the book at the same time as I had to deliver a novel, and uh, nonfiction is easier to collaborate on. Um, so I, I brought somebody else in to help do the research and the drafting. We did the book. It won a Stoker Award. It was uh, the Cryptopedia I did with David Kramer, um, and then did a couple of more collaborations, one with him, one with someone else. And I found it was, it was fun to do. Um, I've, I've been asked to do collaborations on a couple of uh, writing projects. I've, I've collaborated on two novels, um, several novellas, and uh, a couple of short stories, and even one comic book. I did Marvel Zombies Return with Seth Graham Smith, who did Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, um, Fred Van Lent, and David Wellington. We, we co-wrote Marvel Zombies Return, and that was fun. So I've done a ton of collaborations. I, it's not my preferred thing because I, I do prefer to work in my own head. But if the right project comes along, it can be a, a real, real um, fun process to work with somebody else. 
Oh yeah. How about, can we switch gears a little bit? I want to touch on bewilderness a little bit. And I've been listening and tell everybody about that project if you could. So that was an experimental project. It was the second of my experimental projects with Audible. Um, I got and there's a little backstory, so I have to tell the backstory first. So they were a few, some years ago. They were looking into this whole thing about giving away free content on, on Audible, um, and in hopes that it would encourage people to then follow that writer into their paid content. And they asked me if I would write a short story that uh, would help, you know, launch this and and try to help prove the models whether that worked. So they, they, they hired me to write a short horror story called, and I wrote it called Lullaby. It was a ghost story. And it wound up being the number one short story on Audible for the whole year, even after it went to, uh, it was on, well, free for a month, then went on sale, and it continued to sell. And it proved the model. And a lot of people who read that, who had never read me before, or listened to it, rather, wound up getting my other audiobooks. More recently, they asked me if I would like to take that model and expand on it by doing a serialized novel. And um, the first was a short story. It's a novel. So Bewilderness is a fun concept I've had in my head for a while about the, the attempt to open up parallel universes, ideally parallel versions of Earth that aren't populated, but are still the essential same planet so that we could then, you know, spread for overpopulation, mine for resources, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we writers, we write about that stuff and it sounds great, but our first reaction is, yeah, but what's the worst thing that could happen? because that's where our plots are going to come from. Bad stuff happens. All of these parallel Earths wind up colliding together, grinding together in a very bad way. And it was serialized in three parts on uh, Audible, uh, three 30,000-plus word parts, I think they're 32,000 words each. Um, and then so it made a, a complete novel of about 97,000, 98,000 words. And Shana Small uh, was my reader for that. And we had done a lot of auditions to find the right reader for it. We wanted a mixed race actress to do it because the main character was mixed race. And uh, it was a whole bunch of fun. And it did really well for Audible. In fact, we're now discussions for my next thing I'm doing for them. And it was just a lot of fun. It was my first serialized Audible only novel. And it was, it was a hoot. Yeah, yeah. Well, and audiobooks, just in general, I actually listen to most of my books, in all honesty, because we can, yeah, we can, we can do other things, right? We can exercise and cook and clean the house, whatever we need to do. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's really a great medium. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've been an audio fan back from since the cassette days. Uh, I first got hooked on Random House's, sadly, abridged versions of the Travis McGee novels by John D. MacDonald, read by the wonderful Darren McGavin. Uh, I, I fell in love with audiobooks. When I listen for fun, it is audio. I just downloaded the new John Sanford book, um, uh, Ocean Prey, I think it's called. But yeah, I listen to audiobooks all the time. When I'm reading print, it's usually um, something for you know, like a research uh, book. Like I, I just recently got a book on viruses by Carl Zimmer. I'll be diving into that next. Um, but I love audio. And I, I prefer single single. Uh, narrator audio and what's fun now is i've been working with ray porter uh, as my principal audiobook reader so long i hear his voice in my head when i'm writing <laughs> which if if i wasn't a writer would be very creepy and probably the basis for a restraining order but <laughs> since i am a writer it's a great combination and he and i are have become like family with one another and it's 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 a lot of fun Oh, that's so cool. It's just like when you read a tweet or something from somebody. When I, I follow you on social media, so when you tweet something, I'm hearing your voice. I hear the people's voices when, when we do that. It's so funny how that happens. Yep. So what can we look forward to? You, you've teased us with so many little projects you've got coming up, but what, what can we look forward to in the future? Well, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy because last year and this year, I'm, uh, last year I wrote four novels and 15 short stories and comics. This year, uh, I'm just about to finish my first of at least four novels. There'll be two novels in the Keg and the Damned series, which is my epic fantasy series. Uh, they will launch six months apart, but in the spring of next year. Uh, I have a new Joe Ledger novel, number, number 12 in the series, called Relentless, coming out in July. And I'll be writing the, the 13th novel, Shriek, after I finish the Kagan books. I have... Um, uh, writing, you know, editing weird tales. So that'll be out a couple, you know, three times a year right now. I've got two short story collections coming out this year. I've got one zombie short story collection called um, Empty Graves, 
which is uh, a bunch of zombie fiction. You know, the reprints, some of which are are, are re rare enough reprints that even my regular fans won't have seen them. And there's a new story in there too. Uh, and I have a new Joe Ledger short story collection called uh, Secret Missions. Uh, I'm sorry, Secret Missions? Yeah, I think Secret Joe Ledger's Secret Missions coming out in the fall as well. Um, but there's a couple of projects that I'm, I'm working on that unfortunately I can't talk about except vaguely. Like one is the is a series of short novels I'm doing that are a sequel, I'm sorry, a prequel to a, a science fiction movie from about 10 years ago. And uh, there will be a TV series that somebody else is creating. The guy who did the original movie is creating a TV series, but the TV series will use elements from my books as well. So I'll be involved in the TV series as probably an executive producer and continuing to write the books. And then we're just about to make an announce a big announcement with Weird Tales about a uh, a book imprint. We're actually doing a, a, a novel imprint for Weird Tales. So I'll be involved in that and I'll be sharing details. But five, I've got five projects that I can't wait, can't wait to talk about. They're all under non-disclosure agreements. It's such a oh, crap. well, it's exciting. And again, that's what it means to be a prolific writer. And we didn't even really get into some of the media tie-in stuff. You kind of teased us just now a little bit, but well, yeah. actually, there is one coming out at the end of this year. Um, we just finished uh, I, I, another collaboration, but an editorial collaboration between myself and Brian Thomas Schmidt on Alien versus Predator um, Ultimate Prey. It's an anthology. And uh, there was a, I had two collaborations involved in that. One is editing with Brian. The second is actor Louis Ozawa Cheng Chen, who was in the movie Predators, the third of the Predator films. He was Hanzo the Yakuza. But he's also been Man in the High Castle, uh, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and, and tons of other things, Grey's Anatomy. Um, he, he and I co-wrote a story together. And uh, it was his first short story. So, you know, we worked together on it and we had a lot of fun with that. That'll be out from Titan Books later this year. Ah, oh, exciting. A lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Do you have any parting thoughts, words of inspiration, wisdom? Well, <laughs> um, if you're a reader, I would suggest you read outside your comfort zone. Uh, one of the things I like about certain bookstores, like my favorite bookstore in, in my area is, is Mysterious Galaxy here in San Diego. You talk to the booksellers. Um, one of the things I found is really useful is not only go in there for the book you want, ask them what else they recommend. And it doesn't matter if it's way outside your comfort zone, try it. Because if the bookseller is hand selling that, it must be a good book. Expand your reading horizons. And as a writer, constantly look for new ways to open up. My biggest career successes, which is uh, writing thrillers, uh, comic books, and young adult, none of those were on my list of things I thought I wanted to do when, as a writer. They all came up as opportunities that I could have said no to because it's not in my comfort zone. I said yes to, and they became the biggest parts of my career. I mean, Rotten Ruin, my first novel, which was a, a young adult, my agent had to bully me into writing. I think it's in 27th printing now. It's required reading in, in schools all over the world. Um, and I was going, not going to do it because I don't, I don't read YA. I don't know YA. And she, told me to get off my ass and, and learn. <laughs> uh, so great advice. <laughs> get up off your ass. There you go. That's uh, what open, we're underscoring this with. <laughs> it's really, it's really open your mind and see the possibilities beyond what you think, you know, is your, is your zone because sometimes it's so much your zone that it's there because it's comfortable, not necessarily because it's going to provoke you into finding how deep and complex a writer you actually are. The more you try, the more more opportunities open up, and sometimes those sometimes those things that open up are what not only lift you but give you the most fun and the most success. So why wouldn't you want to try it? Oh, exactly, exactly. Jonathan Mayberry, thank you for being with us on okay. the Book Fest. I appreciate it. And, and, and people, folks, I just one quick thing: if uh, if anybody wants to follow me, you probably see my name spelled M A B, not M A Y. I'm all over social media. I have a website. And if you are a writer, on my website, it's a whole page of free stuff for writers. Uh, very useful files. Go download what you want. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And you do have a speaker page here on the BookFest website that has more information about you and links to your website. So if people are like, where do I go? Just find it through the BookFest website. Yep. All right, Jonathan, take care. Thank you again. We'll talk to you later. Thanks so much, Desiree. This was always, always fun. Always a pleasure having you.